Okay, well, welcome to um, the Global Tracheostomy Collaborative Webinar. Um, this is number three in our 2023 series. So I'm um, Dr. Amy Freeman Sanderson, and I'm delighted to be moderating uh, the webinar with my co-host, Professor Michael Brenner. Today, our topic is a holistic approach to care of individuals with a tracheostomy. So optimizing physical and mental health, communication, swallowing, and nutrition. I would just like to thank our sponsors for unrestricted educational grants um, that support our mission and vision uh, at the Global Tracheostomy Collaborative of creating multidisciplinary teams um, of physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, um, speech pathologists, patients and families, um, and many more professionals working together to really disseminate best practices and improve the outcomes um, and care around um, living with a tracheostomy. So I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of land of which we meet today, um, and there's many different lands. So uh, I'm on Gadigal country here in Sydney, Australia, and I pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging, acknowledging them as traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. So um, please feel free to um, pop where you're joining from today um, uh, in the chat so we can um, see where, where you are from across the world. So our key objectives today are to understand the importance to consider the whole person, to optimise health and well-being um, for people um, living with a tracheostomy, to learn about specific roles. So we're spotlighting um, some of the many roles um, that different professionals play, but particularly the roles of pulmonology, speech language pathology, nutrition um, in optimising patient care and outcomes. And also recognise how specialised health um, professional expertise can be combined um, to collectively enhance team-based tracheostomy care. So by way of quick introduction before I hand over, um, today we're delighted to be joined by um, three um, very experienced panel members. So we have Professor Lisa Wolf, Marta Kazanjian and Georgia Hardy um, from uh, across um, different countries. Michael will personally introduce each speaker as we move through the webinar, and we thank the webinar for their expertise that they share with us today and acknowledge the wider, um, you know, the wider knowledge and experiences also shared and contributed by our audience, whether you're joining us live or you're listening to this on catch up. So I'd like to, um, with that, hand over to um, my co-moderator, Professor Brenner. Sure. Well, it's a delight to uh, welcome all of you to this session, and uh, we're very fortunate to have our guests here today. Uh, these include Professor Lisa Wolf, who comes from Northwestern University, the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab in Chicago, uh, Marta Kazanjian from Stony Brook Southampton Hospital in Southampton, New York, and Georgia Hardy from Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. Collectively, they bring expertise in fields of pulmonology, speech language pathology, and nutrition. Uh, and we're looking forward to a comprehensive program that gives a very broad holistic approach to tracheostomy care. And so, um, I think that now we're going to uh, pull up the slides, Amy. I'm not able to see them just yet. Okay, terrific. So our first speaker, uh, Professor Lisa Wolf, is a world-renowned pulmonologist who works in Chicago, Illinois, where she's affiliated with Northwestern University as her primary affiliation and secondarily with the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. She received her medical degree from Ohio State University College of Medicine and completed her postgraduate training at Northwestern University. She's board certified in both sleep medicine and pulmonary disease. Professor Wolf is an influential advocate in the ALS community. She is continuously inspired by patients and their families, and she's a steadfast supporter of empowering individuals with tracheostomy and their families. Her inspiration comes from providing structure and options for patients and their families, incorporating them as part of an integrated medical team that partners with them from initial diagnosis and throughout the course of illness. Uh, I welcome Professor Lisa Wolf.
Okay, thank you, Dr. Brenner. Can you hear me now? You sound great. All right, great. So um, if you could advance the slide, are you guys gonna advance the slides or do I? Okay, if you could give me one yep. more word. Yeah, we'll run them. Okay, good. So when we talk about the role of a pulmonologist in a trach team, the first thing that I wanna talk about is issues of shared decision-making. One of our goals today was to integrate some issues around medical ethics and tracheostomy care and how that impacts how we put our teams together. What we know for our patients is that knowledge is power. The more they are aware of what their choices are and the reason for those choices, the better they are going to do at making those choices. The three questions model for shared decision-making comes from the National Health Service in the UK, where they make sure that patients who are making decisions about tracheostomy know what their options are, what their pros and cons are, and then act to support them in decision-making. Next slide. Um, and so the model that we have here in Chicago comes from our integrated ALS program with the support of the Les Turner, so the Les Turner ALS Foundation. And you'll see on our website that there are specific tools for every kind of decision that a patient with ALS would make. And although it is um, ALS as a neurologic disease, the pulmonologist plays a specific integrated role in helping to make these shared decisions between the medical team and the patient. If you went to our website to where this section is, you would see that we have two things. One is um, an area where you can have videos about learning about tracheostomies and how and why and when a patient with ALS would make the decision for trach. But what you also see is a breathing guide where a patient uses an interactive question and answer model so that they have full engagement as part of their education, dividing these um, really challenging decisions into digestible pieces. And that allows them then to feel like they're really part of the team. We find that this multimedia based option really enhances our ability to do shared decision-making. Next slide. So the next thing that we do as we look at placing a permanent tracheostomy for a patient is help them to develop a trach plan. A trach plan will include things like who is going to change your trach? How often will it be changed? Where will you get the supplies? What are your expectations for who will be educated about the device? And the expectations should be set ahead of time prior to having the actual surgery for the trach. In addition, we want the family to be aware that the trach plan is there, that it's in place, and that they should try not to vary from it unless it's been decided with the trach care team. And so what we do then is take our idea of shared decision-making and then put it into concrete form as we transition into these plans. Next slide. So the next thing that we want the pulmonologist to do as part of a trach care team, and this is especially into the ethical realm, is talk about the fact that preserving speech is preserving autonomy and that the primary goal of a physician, any physician, but a pulmonologist in this case, is to make sure that we've preserved autonomy and that that autonomy should be developed as it is age appropriate from young child to adult. Next slide. So let's talk about why speech is important for autonomy. Because without communication, patients can't direct their care needs. And the ability to direct their care means that they are autonomous. They need to be able to design care schedules. They need to communicate for safety needs and safety purposes. And the options now have 
vastly exploded from simple things like alarms at the bedside or a bell that you can ring all the way through brain computer interfaces for communication. And I have to say last week for the first time in our ALS clinic, we had a patient who had a brain computer interface bring her communication device and was able to answer yes, no questions for us using only her thoughts. So really the sky's the limit on this. The next thing is looking at how we do this age appropriately. You cannot just take a child and say, okay, when you're 18, now you make all of your own decisions. What we want to do is use their communication skills starting at pre-adolescence, when they start to be aware of their body and have some sense of privacy, that they should learn how to work with a caregiver rather than a parent for bathing and dressing. And then as things advance through high school and then even college, we want them to be able to use their communication skills to develop their caregiver's time with a specific schedule, and that way they stay in control. Next slide. Um, the next thing, and this is, this is a representation of what most of July is like in my hospital. I'm, I'm sure that you all have the same July experiences. So that's a picture of me going, team, what's the airway clearance plan for your trach patient? And these are the answers I usually get. What's a trach plan? What is an airway clearance plan? What do you mean I need one of those? or the person who just says, I just suction when necessary. My favorite is the guys who say they use an acapella because you can't use an acapella while you have an open trach. <clears throat> or the people who just say, well, I come in every 12 hours and change the inner cannula. So clearly after July, we hope they have better answers. So next slide. So things that we ask um, as a pulmonologist for our trach patients to put on their um, plan for airway clearance would be the use of nebulized medications like beta agonists to help with cilia functioning, thinning secretions with saline, but also they can use vibratory techniques or positive pressure techniques. And depending on where in the world you are, you may or may not have access to these devices, such as IPV or an intermittent percussive ventilator, the Valara, the Metaneb, the Cough Assist, or um, sorry, my last one is cut off here, or just an Ambu bag for breath stacking. But what's most important is that you think to yourself, based on your patient's physiology, do they just need vibrations for thick tenacious secretions? Or do they need positive pressure because they also have a neuromuscular component to the reason for the trach in the first place? And as we make these decisions, you can pick which are the best devices and ahead of time have your airway clearance plan so that you teach trach care and you tr teach airway clearance planning at the same time. Next. Elisa, could you go yep, back? Am I past my 10 minutes? Oh, no, I was just wondering if you could oh. briefly clarify for our audience some of the terminology that you used. Uh, for example, uh, an example of a beta agonist, uh, what IPV stands for, an example yeah. of vibratory uh, treatment. So a beta agonist would just be an inhaled beta agonist like albuterol or salbuterol, depending on where in the world you are, that would be available. Now, most of the time we think about beta agonists like albuterol there for bronchodilation, but we also know that they improve cilia function. And with that increasing beating rate, they increase the, um, the uh, escalator for um, sputum and secretions, helping to get them up and out from small airways so that they can be cleared out. In terms of the IPV, the IPV is the intermittent percussive ventilator, which is a device that can be attached to the tracheostomy and it vibrates very quickly with positive pressure in order to help release secretions, open plugged or collapsed airways, and allow a patient to cough out secretions more effectively. Now, the original IPV was uh, discovered by Dr. Bird. <clears throat> Sorry, Dr. Bird, 
who's the guy that invented the first ventilator. You guys may have heard of the bird ventilator. He actually invented the IPV for his wife who uh, had terrible COPD and they were living in um, Southern California and it was very, very dry there. And so he invented that as the very first airway clearance device. More modern versions of it include the Velara, which is a current device that's made for home use. It has a compressor internally that's been miniaturized so that we can give both vibration and pressure together with nebulized medication to help open the airways and liberate the secretions and allow for coughing and lung volume recruitment in one treatment. And those can be attached to the tracheostomy to do that with. Other institutions may have a metaneb, which is a similar device, but does not have the internal compressor. So it's only used in hospitals because it has to be hooked up to the wall. Um, the cough assist device um, is a typical device that we've seen for years. The biggest difference with it is that it does both inhale and exhale, and the newest versions of it can do that together with vibrations. The difference between that and say the Velara device is that the cough assist does not give nebulized treatments together with that pressure and vibration. And if you guys are having trouble getting your cough assists, um, that has been an issue because the original Respironics device is not being made right now. So if you guys have questions about alternatives, um, we can get that in the question and answer section. And then of course the Ambu bag should be available for all of our patients because it is simple, cheap, it can be folded up and easily kept in a bag or in the back of a car. And we believe all patients with a tracheostomy should have access to an Ambu bag. Is that okay, Michael? That's terrific. I, I think that the challenges around airway clearance are a perennial issue for uh, many patients, uh, especially those with uh, neurodegenerative disorders. And uh, we had uh, a keynote at one of our prior international tracheostomy symposia who really said that a uh, cough assist device changed his life. And so I appreciate you taking the time to elaborate a little bit. Yeah, and it's one of the reasons why I feel like a pulmonologist is a key person on a tracheostomy team, because that should be the role of the pulmonologist is to work on these secretion issues. And they're ubiquitous, for sure. Um, the other part to it is that um, chronic infection becomes a big issue for about one third of patients. Um, we know that the more underlying lung issue, the more likely you are to have the chronic infection issues, but it really is highly variable about how frequently it happens. We do recommend that patients have Lucan's traps, which I have a picture of on the screen, which is just the easy way of getting your sample from the airway. Patients should actually have them at home because if they call me and say, hey, I'm infected, but they have no way of getting the sample to the lab, it really delays therapy. So we actually, every time a patient comes to the office, we give them you know, two, three, four Lucan's traps and say, just keep this at home for when you need it. Excuse me. Um, we like to get some standing tracheal aspirates so that if you call and tell me that you're, excuse me, having a problem with infection, that I can base my antibiotic plan based on your previous cultures. We like to get tracheal aspirates rather than bronchoscopy because mostly what we see with these patients is tracheitis, not pneumonia. And because these are tracheal bronchial infections, if we get a tracheal endotracheal aspirate, we can look at semi-quantitative results, looking at the number of white cells. That will tell us whether we have true infection or just colonization. And the last thing is, if we feel like this is limited to just a tracheal bronchial infection, consider inhaled antibiotics to reduce complications seen from parenteral antibiotics. Also, non-antibiotic techniques, super important, aggressive oral care. And we have found that in COVID, nobody went to the dentist, just didn't happen. So now everybody's trying to get into the dentist and it can be very difficult. So we really encourage our patients to be proactive with their dental care. Also, um, elevation of the head of the bed to about 35 to 45 degrees to prevent micro aspiration. 
And we want people to have frequent trach changes if they have colonization with gram negative bacteria. Um, in the US, this becomes a huge problem because we can't get trachs in adults more frequently than every three months. Therefore, a trach cleaning plan should be part of your overall trach care plan. Next slide. Um, so just in summary, because I don't want to take up too much time, the pulmonologist should be an important part of your team because they should help you to develop a shared decision making about the trach before surgery. After surgery, they should help to develop your trach care plan, and they should be there for complications down the road for aggressive airway clearance and infection. So um, thanks, and then I'll pass it off. I think Marta is next. Terrific. Thanks for a wonderful talk, Lisa. And uh, that was a great way to kick off this session. And uh, I think we all took some uh, cues from that that we can apply to the pulmonary aspects of patient care. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Marta Kazanjian from Stony Brook Southampton Hospital in Southampton, New York. She is a clinical assistant professor and the department head for speech pathology and swallowing at the Stony Brook Southampton Hospital. She's an ASHA fellow and nationally recognized medical speech pathologist who's board certified in swallowing disorders. Marta's commitment to person-centered care was recognized in 2020 by Planetary International when she became a fellow of person-centered care. Marta's deep interest in the whole patient prompted her to obtain more education at the University of Arizona's integrative medical program where she was certified in integrative lifestyle management. She's one of the first medical speech pathologists in the US and national board certification in health and wellness. Marta brings this unique perspective to her speech pathology practice. During her career, she's worked with patients with serious illness, including neurological diagnoses, neurodegenerative diseases, pulmonary disease, and laryngeal disorders. She's the author of numerous peer reviewed journal articles and book chapters, and is regularly invited to speak in state, national, and international meetings. Uh, perhaps most notably, she recently completed the third edition of her textbook, Communication and Swallowing Management of Tracheostomized and Ventilator-Dependent Individuals, which is co-authored with her colleague, Karen Dykeman. The third edition serves as an international resource for both graduate students and seasoned clinicians. So I give you Marta to speak to us about the speech language pathologist role in speech and communication and swallowing. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. So I'm going to speak to you about the role of the speech pathologist, specifically in optimizing communication and swallowing. Medical speech pathologists are also vital members of the tracheostomy team. We treat patients in multiple settings, uh, acute care, including intensive care units, subacute rehabilitation, and long-term settings as well as in the community. And this includes patients across the age span, both adults and pediatric with disordered pulmonary systems, typically from post-extubation, again, tracheostomy and or ventilator dependence. So in this picture, uh, this picture shows a pulse oximeter, which is one example of equipment that a medical speech pathologist will use during the evaluation and treatment of, an, of a tracheostomized patients specifically to monitor their oxygenation and heart rate. Um, so here you see a standard tracheostomy in place. Our patients commonly experience difficulties with both communication and swallowing, and speech pathologists are uniquely trained to appreciate the contribution of the upper airway to both communication and swallowing. Next slide. So let's orient to the upper and lower airways before the placement of a tracheostomy tube. So the upper airway encompasses the vocal folds, the vocal tract, and the articulators. The lower airway houses the lungs and the area below the vocal folds. So why is the upper airway important? Well, it's crucial for phonation, voice production, respiration, breathing, and airway protection, including coughing, for example, during swallowing. Additionally, 
we now understand that the relationship between breathing and swallowing um, has really emphasized the importance of the speech pathologist's role. So in this schematic, you see the airflow coming from the lungs or the lower airways through the vocal folds and mouth, allowing for voice uh, and speech production. So your airflow is your power source for voice and which your articulators modulate into speech. So what happens if you disrupt the airflow between the lower and upper airways? Well, that's exactly what happens when a tracheostomy tube is placed. The tracheostomy tube is placed below the level of the vocal folds. And trach tubes can be either cuffed or cuffless. Cuffed tracheostomy tubes, as you can see in this picture, fills the airway and will essentially eliminate airflow to the upper airway if fully inflated. Uh, but even uncuffed tracheostomy tubes can disrupt normal airflow as, the, um, as they allow air to take the path of least resistance in and out of the tracheostomy tube without fully reaching the vocal folds. Next slide. This is where the speech pathologist will actually start the assessment for voicing. Based on our patient's ability to exhale, out the upper airway, we attempt to restore airflow to a more normal pattern. And in many cases, uh, the patient's phonation or, or voice will be restored. Here in this diagram, you see a one-way speaking valve, which allows air to enter into the tracheostomy tube, but then directs the air through the upper airway or the vocal folds, restoring a more normalized physiology. And so in some cases, depending on the individual patient need, we may recommend to the tracheostomy team specialized tracheostomy tubes that have particular features to assist with phonation. So the role of the speech pathologist in facilitating communication, and as Dr. Wolf mentioned, really I would be remiss not to mention that Restoration of voice takes time and in some cases may not be possible due to a medical or a neurological condition such as ALS. So we can offer patients with even minimal movements a way to communicate as pictured here in, um, in my slide uh, where a patient can use an eye gaze communication system. Some patients can spell even novel messages with um, a eye gaze device such as the island. Above all though, providing our patients with a way to call for help and to communicate their needs to, as Dr. Wolf suggested beautifully, to maintain autonomy when, when verbal communication is not possible is always the medical speech pathologist's priority. So we've spoken about voice, but actually I'd like to speak for a bit about the impact of tracheostomy on swallowing. Tracheostomy tubes will always disrupt phonation or voicing, but do not necessarily cause disordered swallowing, which we refer to as dysphagia. However, many uh, tracheostomized and ventilator dependent patients may experience difficulty swallowing due to their critical illness, multiple comorbidities, um, and the impact of losing that upper airway flow. So for example, normally we cough to clear substances such as secretions or even food particles out of our airway at that critical or crucial um, moment. So if you see in this schematic, who's the patient's uh, cough, actually inflated, a fully inflated cuff blocks the production of an effective cough through the upper airway or through the, the vocal folds. Next slide. So, so you can see that the loss of airflow can not only affect an impact voice, but an, an impact an effective cough, which is very important airway protective mechanism for all of us. And we also know that the timing of airway closure at the appropriate moment during swallowing is also crucial. Subtle disruptions in airflow um, can influence the sensory receptors in the nervous system and actually interfere with the coordination of breathing and swallowing. 
So we see that the inflated tracheostomy tubes do impact airflow. But I want to point out that it's very important to understand they do not prevent aspiration, which is often a misnomer. Tracheostomy, and you can see in this slide, this slide actually depicts aspiration that has already occurred because the food has passed through the vocal folds and is sitting on the cuff and is at risk of traveling below. Speech pathologists routinely uh, perform tracheal suctioning after specific training from either respiratory therapy or medicine or nursing staff so that we can help our patients um, with their secretion management and potential aspiration. But what I'd like to point out is that cuffs are very important, but the main purpose of a tracheostomy tube cuff is to maintain proper ventilation for patients on mechanical respirators and to reduce gross aspiration of secretions especially in sedated patients. So safe cuff deflation is essential to the speech pathologist's work. With our colleagues in pulmonary medicine and respiratory therapy, we can safely deflate the cuff, ventilate a patient, and restore that important upper airway flow. And through this in intervention, we actually can assist the patient in the weaning process, allowing them to breathe on their own while facilitating communication and safe swallowing. Next slide. Our process to manage uh, dysphagia begins with the receipt of a physician order to perform what we call the clinical swallowing evaluation. And that's where we assess overall medical status, ventilation, cough strength, and secretion management. And our goal is to safely, is to, is to actually manage swallow safety, reducing the risk of aspiration, while also managing swallow efficiency to clear food and, and liquid from the mouth and the pharynx. Next slide. So from that clinical evaluation, then an instrumental assessment may, may be needed. And so here you see me preparing standardized barium consistencies during a video fluoroscopic radiological procedure. And that's performed in joint consultation with our colleagues in radiology, um, as well as another uh, instrumental exam, the endoscopic evaluation of swallow safety, or we refer to as a fees, the, which provides uh, uh, essential and it really detailed information on the physiology of the swallow, both of these exams in real time for treatment planning and recommendations of a safe and an appropriate diet. Next slide. So here is just a, a picture of my endoscope that we use to perform my these examinations. And it's a small nasal endoscope that's inserted in the patient's nose to view swallowing mechanism while eating and drinking. And we very commonly will use this procedure in ICU and right by in the bedside it, for patients who are in the hospital. Next slide. So the speech pathologist, we've got lots of tools in our therapy box, and we, and we use these to help our patients with tracheostomy. Pictured here are just two of many, many options. Speaking valves restore upper airway flow, as, as I discussed previously, and that's your photo on the left. And on the right, um, and the left actually is a picture of passing your closed position speaking valves. On the, on the right is the breather, and that is an example of a respiratory muscle strengthening resistive device that we use. But there are many different types of speaking valves and respiratory muscle strength trainers, and it's important for the speech pathologist working with uh, each individual patient to really choose a device that meets that individual person's needs. Next slide. Um, so you're actually going to be hearing about the role of the registered dietitian uh, next on the tracheostomy team. And so part of our dysphagia management when we initiate a oral diet is we work very closely with the RD and recommend a standard safe texture within the framework that we refer to as the International Dysphagia Diet Initiative or ITSI framework. And this, this uh, framework, we uh, collaborate with our colleagues around the globe so that we're all talking the same language about different textures. Next slide. 
So I appreciate your attention. And in my next talk, I'll look forward to introducing you to one of my patients. So thank you. Marta, thank you so much for that wonderful discussion of the role of the speech language pathologist. Uh, there's so many nuances in the work that you do. Uh, what I've been struck by is just how profoundly grateful patients are for the quality of life that's restored when they're given their voice back uh, and their ability to eat again. So um, the work that you do each day is uh, valuable, uh, more than more than we can say. And it really dovetailed very nicely with the points that Lisa had made about the importance of speech for patients' autonomy and ability to guide their own care. Uh, so now we have the pleasure of hearing from Georgia Hardy. Uh, Georgia is a senior critical care dietitian at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne. Uh, she has uh, gained an extended scope of practice that includes fine bore nasal gastric tube insertion. And of note, she's the first dietitian to hold this in the state of Victoria. She has extensive experience working in high acuity critical care units in both Australia and the United Kingdom. She also worked for a period in a chronic respiratory failure unit servicing home tracheostomy patients. During her time in the United Kingdom, Georgia was a British Dietetic Association Critical Care Specialist Group Committee member. Georgia has a strong interest in research and believes gaining an understanding of the patient experience is key to effective practice change. She's also commencing a mixed methods PhD in critical care nutrition via the Australia New Zealand Intensive Care Research Center beginning in 2024. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Georgia. Thank you very much, Professor Brenner. Um, I'm very privileged. I believe I'm the first dietitian to be presenting at one of these webinars. So I feel very privileged for that opportunity. Um, it's gonna be a real whistle stop tour of uh, nutrition care for patients with a tracheostomy. So I'm gonna be talking about both periods of in sort of acute critical illness, as well as through the recovery and re rehabilitation periods as well. So why is nutrition important for people with a tracheostomy? So before a tracheostomy is placed, nutrition is really key to helping minimize muscle loss um, that's associated with critical illness. It's important to keep the skin healthy and intact. So helping to prevent things like pressure injuries. It also helps to support the immune system. After a tracheostomy is placed, nutrition has a key role in helping to heal um, any sort of surgery, but also the tracheostomy um, tract itself. It helps to support the strength of the respiratory muscles, which helps with weaning off the ventilator. Um, and it helps with strength and functional recovery. So overall, nutrition plays a really key role in supporting recovery, healing, and other therapies by giving the cells what they need to heal and regenerate. So how is nutrition provided to patients with a tracheostomy? Um, Marta's already uh, covered a little bit of this. So certainly um, oral diet might be possible, which uh, will be our speech pathologists will be the ones that are recommending exactly what is safe for a patient um, to eat and drink with a tracheostomy. It might include nutrition supplement drinks to help a patient meet their energy and protein requirements. And there really is a focus usually on higher energy and higher protein nutrition, which can be quite different to general healthy eating advice. And that's because patients have higher needs for this to help with recovery and rehabilitation. Tube feeding, however, is also very common in patients with the tracheostomy. This might be via a nasogastric tube for patients who need short to medium term uh, tube feeding. If, however, longer term tube feeding is anticipated, then a longer term feeding tube such as a gastrostomy might be placed. If there's issues with the function of the stomach, then that can be bypassed and nutrition can be delivered directly into the small intestine. If, however, the gut isn't functional or isn't accessible, then nutrition can also be delivered directly into the bloodstream for patients. So what's the role of the dietitian? We undertake a nutrition assessment. So this includes looking at things like anthropometry, so weight, height, and body composition for patients. We look at patients' uh, blood results. We look at their clinical condition, what sort of therapies they're receiving, what sort of medications, how often are they on the ventilator, as well as considering any 
symptoms that are either related to nutrition or might affect nutrition. So things like nausea, vomiting, bowel motions. We then set nutrition targets for patients. Um, so we want to set targets for energy and protein. These can be done through uh, calculations or it can potentially be measured using a device called an indirect calorimeter, which you can see on this slide. We then take this information um, and come up with a nutrition diagnosis. So we diagnose things such as malnutrition if that's an issue that's present. We then come up with a nutrition intervention plan that's in line with current evidence. And it's really key that we are monitoring um, what is happening with this plan. So for example, we know that just because we prescribe nutrition doesn't mean that that's necessarily what our patients are receiving. It's very common for there to be interruptions to nutrition. Um, so we wanna monitor how much is actually being received by our patients, as well as changes in clinical condition, which might change a patient's nutrition requirements. We advocate for things like minimizing unnecessary fasting, medications um, to help control symptoms that are going to affect nutrition, um, so medications to help control uh, nausea or help the functioning of the stomach. We also advocate potentially for the escalation of nutrition support. So if a patient isn't able to eat and drink enough, we might be advocating for the insertion of a nasogastric tube, or if there isn't enough nutrition going through the tube, we might be advocating for the use of parenteral nutrition. Overall, we're really personalizing the nutrition care to the individual patient we have in front of us. I also like to say nutrition is a team sport. We collaborate very closely with the whole multidisciplinary team. So our nutrition plan has to be in line with the medical plan. It's usually undertaken by our nursing staff. Marta's mentioned we work very closely with our speech pathologist colleagues. Um, and nutrition is also going to help to support the functional and physical therapies our patients receive. So I'm going to very quickly talk about what the literature tells us about um, nutrition across dis different periods for our patients. So during acute critical illness, we know that early nutrition is beneficial. We talk about commencing nutrition support within 24 to 48 hours of ICU admission. However, we know that early in critical illness, too much nutrition can actually be detrimental. So if you have a look at this graph, you can see this is talking about resting energy expenditure. So the amount of energy your body is using when you are at rest. And following an insult, a critical insult to the body, resting energy expenditure actually decreases initially. It then goes on to increase um, potentially quite significantly past where it would normally be and eventually it sort of starts heading back towards normal. But providing too much nutrition during that early phase where energy expenditure is decreased can be harmful to our patients. So it can increase the amount of time on the ventilator um, and the amount of time in, in critical care. We know, I mentioned this earlier, but our evidence um, tells us this as well, that prescribed nutrition is not necessarily the same as delivered nutrition. Patients are fasted for a number of reasons in hospital and sometimes they don't tolerate the nutrition that is being delivered to them. We also know that muscle wasting occurs for a lot of different reasons. So certainly inadequate nutrition can be one of them, but even with adequate nutrition, patients who have an extended critical uh, period of critical illness are going to lose muscle mass. And that could be as a result of critical illness itself. Things such as hypoxia, certain medications and therapies can all contribute towards muscle wasting. Following uh, ICU and when we start looking at sort of a period of recovery and re rehabilitation, if patients are allowed oral intake, we know that it's often really difficult for our patients to eat and drink enough to meet their nutrition needs. So you can see uh, in this graph, which is um, an observational study by Emma Ridley, who's a clinician researcher out of Australia, patients who are receiving oral intake alone we're actually meeting less than 40% of their nutrition needs. When nutrition supplement drinks were added in, so again, this is an oral intervention, patients were meeting sort of just above 75% of their needs, so that certainly made it much better, but it was actually only patients who were receiving both enteral nutrition and oral intake who were meeting 100% of their nutrition needs in this study. 
there's small amounts of evidence that tells us that tube feeding does not reduce appetite um, or oral intake. And so really all of this tells us that feeding tubes remain an important tool um, until oral intake is adequate for patients. And this um, reduction in intake of energy and protein can actually continue for patients following hospital discharge, so even once they're home and in the community as well. I've spoken about uh, the quantitative um, evidence, so the things that we can measure with numbers, but I think it's really important that we also look at the qualitative evidence. So what do our patients actually experience? So this uh, quote I've got here is from a study by Judith Merriweather, who's a clinician researcher out of Scotland. And it really helps to um, exemplify how eating become, can become a real chore for patients and the enjoyment can be lost. So this patient has said, I'm eating because I have to. I'm eating because it is necessary to live to eat. You've got to get your dietary stuff, your nutrition, all the stuff you need to get by in life, but it's a struggle now. We also know that there's a lot of factors that could affect a patient's intake. So from physiological and functional um, issues such as poor appetite, dysphagia, pain, nausea and vomiting, but also functional things like actually being able to feed yourself. When a patient's in hospital, there's lots of organisational barriers and food service related barriers. So things like having unfamiliar foods, being made nil by mouth and missing meals because of tests and treatments. There's also psychological and social factors involved as well. So things like low mood, sometimes nutrition doesn't feel like a priority in the context of significant um, health issues going on. And also the lack of so social interaction. Usually you'd sit down um, at a table potentially with a friend or family member, which is often lost in the hospital uh, environment. So just to quickly run down what I was hoping to get across for you guys today. Nutrition is important throughout the healthcare journey and the needs for nutrition changes throughout the process of recovery. The dietitian's role includes knowledge of current evidence, advocating for appropriate nutrition and personalizing nutrition care to the individual. Feeding tubes can remain an important tool for recovery even following ICU discharge. And there are lots of challenges for patients to being able to eat adequately following a period of critical illness. And collaboration and teamwork are really an important part of nutrition care. So overall nutrition really is a key part um, of recovery and rehabilitation. Thank you. And thanks so much for that wonderful talk, Georgia. It really highlights um, how, much, how much we tend to under-recognize the role of nutrition in, in the recovery of our patients. It's, um, it's been well documented that, especially in patients who are sedated, uh, they have tremendous muscle wasting, and it's probably a combination of factors, uh, but neglect of the need for nutrition, uh, oral or enteral, is, uh, is really one of the driving factors that can delay recovery. So thanks for those illuminating insights um, to an area that I think has received too little attention. Uh, so now we're going to double back to Marta. Um, if anyone uh, wishes to post additional questions to the Q&A, we can try to address those at the end too, although we'll be going close to the hour. Uh, so Marta is going to bring it all together with a more comprehensive, holistic view of patient care. Uh, so with that, I give you Marta once again. Thank you, Michael. So um, I thought I would start off with the definition, uh, what is health? And so according to the World Health Organization's longstanding definition of health, as being more than simply the absence of disease. Integrative medicine, according to the Wild Foundation, is healing-oriented medicine that takes into account the whole person, body, mind, and spirit, including all aspects of lifestyle. And it emphasizes the therapeutic relationship and makes sense of all the appropriate therapies, both conventional and alternative. So what I'd like to do is I thought I'd, I would um, actually introduce you first to my wellness wheel, um, which really incorporates what I call the core areas of health. 
all of which interact and intertwine with each other to allow optimal whole health. And I use a wheel to represent the essential role of each spoke, um, as the wheel cannot turn properly if one spoke is broken. And so the whole medical team, including allied medical professionals like the medical speech pathologist and the nutritionist dietitian, have big roles in supporting whole health. So, uh, so in the interest of time, let's just highlight a few uh, core areas of health. So remember the importance of sleep. You might ask, well, why is the speech pathologist thinking about sleep? But then I would, I would like you to think about how poor sleep impacts you in your day-to-day -day functioning. So for Reza, we used partial cuff deflation um, and certainly to start off with facilitating in the beginning, especially upper airway flow so that he could clear his throat and cough his secretions out of his airway. And so almost immediately he began to feel more comfortable and in control, but he continued to be worried about his ability to call for help, particularly at nighttime, which seemed to impact his ability to fall asleep. So I gave him an alerting signal, which he used to call for help from, for, from one room, his room, to another. Next slide. Uh, so you are what you eat. And certainly the role of the dietitian was so beautifully highlighted. So as far as nutrition, um, when we start to introduce foods, we selected foods that supported good health. Dysphagia clinicians uh, can consider healthy choices during therapy while modifying consistencies to meet the needs of the patient. And so instead of using traditional puree, which is like applesauce, for example, in our typical facility setting with added sugars, we spoke about making homemade versions of applesauce. And we used foods like avocado for good oils and made guacamole for good fats, and we use rogata uh, cheese for protein and shows healthy vegetables um, across the color spectrum. And of course, Reza, he, he just loved, to, loved food, but he learned actually to make healthy, um, conscious decisions that supported his overall health. So here I list some of the areas that we worked closely with the registered dietitian. Uh, Resiliency. So resiliency refers to stress protective behaviors and speech pathologists will often focus on physiology mediated by the vagus nerve, including laryngeal valving for voice production and cough. But the vagus nerve is also responsible for not only sensing stress, but, affect, but also affecting many of the symptoms that, uh, uh, the, the symptoms of stress. So, and, and there are many symptoms that patients can have, um, heart palpitations and upset stomach and even ulcers that are actually mediated by the vagus nerve. So research shows that the vagus nerve can help acute stress response and breath work is a wonderful non-invasive way for clinicians to assist their patients improving resiliency. So my teacher, Dr. Andrew Weil, taught me to use the 478 breath. Breathe in through the nose, hold for seven, breathe out with pursed lips for a count of eight. And it can improve both heart rate, heart rate variability and blood pressure. Um, slowing down the breath and with controlled breathing has really shown to have many positive psychological effects on both the brain and the body. And once I put a one-way speaking uh, valve in line with the ventilator, Riza could could use his 478. So thank you so much for your attention. I hope I've given you some food for thought about whole person care for, for patients with tracheostomy. Thanks so much, Marta, for tying it all together. So with that, um, we're getting ready to wrap up our program, but I wanna make sure that everyone is aware of the upcoming seventh International Tracheostomy Symposium. We've got some really outstanding keynotes for this session and wonderful sessions. We've uh, confirmed Anna Schrunten, who is the author of Shared Struggles, uh, basically a pediatrician, uh, an attorney, parents experience, uh, 
taking on those challenges, we have the director of the Armstrong Institute at Johns Hopkins, as well as uh, an emeritus professor uh, who has worked extensively in global health and tracheostomy care, as well as leadership within the Global Tracheostomy Collaborative. Uh, it's really a wonderful forum that brings together the whole spectrum and rainbow of different professionals, uh, very much in the spirit of this session. Um, and uh, that will be on October 20th to 21st at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Uh, so with that, why don't we open it up to a uh, discussion of a few questions. I know we are at the hour, so we'll keep it somewhat brief. I know that there was uh, one that came from Melissa uh, who had to leave the session, but I think is a really important question, uh, which related to uh, for families with low incomes, uh, how do we go about ensuring access to tracheostomy care uh, with all the necessary devices? Yeah, we'll throw that out to the panel, Lisa. Sorry. Yeah, so um, what I would tell you is that it's a huge difference um, where in the world you are trying to get this done. Um, and so I would say that in the US, um, there's going to be a big difference depending on if you are in a state that has taken Medicaid expansion versus one that hasn't those with Medicaid expansion are gonna have a lot more access to tracheostomy supplies and equipment. And so um, I know our friends in Canada as well, there's a huge variation province to province. And so we've seen patients say from Nova Scotia go to Ontario so that they can have more access. I wish there was a better answer to that, but unfortunately these are the sacrifices our families often need to make. I mean, that in terms of looking at access to equipment as well, um, I think leads on a little bit um, in, you know, indirectly or directly to um, access for uh, clinicians as well. So this one in the uh, chat is about um, if a facility doesn't have access to instrumental equipment um, and we're really looking at the patient goals and one of those goals is really about resumption of oral intake, be that sort of part or full, what factors um, or criteria um, can clinicians consider for uh, clinical swallowing assessments? And, you know, this also might lead on to both, you know, aspects, um, Mara and Georgia, for swallowing and also optimising, um, you know, the oral nutrition as well. So if both of you wouldn't mind just um, commenting, giving your thoughts on that question. I mean, that's a really great question, and I can appreciate sort of when clinicians struggle with having adequate uh, resources like instrumental assessment. I think it becomes very difficult because you're sort of working in the dark, um, and yet we try to make sure that we are we understand the physiology of what's of what's going on. I mean, when you don't have if the patient cannot tolerate upper airway flow with cuff deflation. Um, the challenge certainly is that we've now restricted the patient's airway protection ability by virtue of cough. Uh, but I did mention at, during my presentation that sometimes we recommend specialized tracheostomy tubes. I was involved in the early days when the Blum tracheostomy tube came to market. I did some of the uh, original uh, beta testing with patients to see how we could adequately ventilate patients uh, at the same time as allow that patient to have a fully inflated cuff, but using a specialized tracheostomy tube like the Blum in providing upper airway flow. And so certainly, uh, you know, perhaps you can learn about it. It's manufactured by Pulmodyne. And uh, what I think is important is for us to certainly think about patient-centered goals, but at the same time, navigate the best uh, possible options for our patients so that we can maintain safety. Because when we're not having upper airway flow at all, as I said, no cough, you really don't have the means to assess the patient. And having said that, I, I, I'd like to also mention, in the old days, we used to talk about what we called the blue dye test where we would, uh, we would actually dye, use food coloring and dye food um, uh, to see whether or not when the patient was eating, if things would actually come out of their tracheostomy tube. 
what we've learned and the research has told us that that really is 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 a, a screening tool at best and making oral feeding decisions uh, with that method, uh, that screening method is really not in the best interest uh, of patient safety. Um, Marta, can, can I just say one thing real quick? Sure. Um, in patients who have full-time mechanical ventilation needs, who are going to be doing simultaneous leak speech on their vent, you really have to have a pulmonologist who understands what they're doing. There is a huge risk for overventilation and hypocapnia in association with leak speech. I can't give you all the reasons for that and how to fix it in 10 minutes. I mean, that would be a one hour seminar all on its own. But if you are working in a community where you don't have a pulmonologist who understands how to do this, I guess the most that I could say is ask them to reach out to me and we can try to educate them on what their options are and what they can do about it. Um, I will say that one of the big issues that's making it a bigger problem right now is that the LTV ventilator as it is coming out of the market because it's not being made and we don't have the resources for it, um, it cannot be replaced one-to-one -one for a leak speech patient with any other ventilator on the market. That is a real dangerous risk for developing alkalosis during which patients can have seizures, heart arrhythmias, et cetera. And so, like I said, it's a long discussion on how to fix it, but I do want people to be aware of the dangers and know that you can't do one-to-one -one swaps at home. It needs to be done in a monitored environment. And you know, thank you so much, actually, for really highlighting that uh, that all the speech pathologists who who are listening, when you're working with ventilator dependent patients, particularly, you should never, ever, ever uh, work independently without working with with the physician. I mean, I, that uh, you know, I, I want to double double highlight that. So thank you for 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 bringing that to the to attention of the audience. I'll just um, add to that question um, as well. If, for example, a patient isn't able to progress perhaps to a full oral diet or there's other limitations, you know, which dietitians would very much be um, looking to our speech pathologist colleagues for, but we can then come in and, and try and help personalise or, or try to work within those restrictions so that the patient is still getting enjoyment from what they are able to safely have. Um, so there can be some goals, even if you can't get to exactly where you want to. And part of that might be related to not having, you know, access to um, some of those assessment tools, but there's always ways that uh, we can work towards um, different goals within those restrictions. And yeah, uh, thank you so much for highlighting. I think it just emphasises the importance of teamwork. Um, and that everyone um, has um, skills and um, assessment and management support um, to really optimize um, what that person and their, you know, their family needs. Um, so what are the needs now? Are they going to change? And really highlighting the importance of understanding benefits and risks, because with every decision that, you know, there are going to be um, outcomes, um, which can vary according um, to the person, their situation, um, their environment, and their sort of underlying um, clinical um, diagnosis as well. But really highlighting, I think all of you highlighted the importance of um, across our, um, our system. So looking at our body systems, looking at our um, function and activities, and then wider, really, how do we participate? How do we engage? How do we you know, do all these things in terms of the activities that I want to do and um, really, you know, that people identify as, as them. So um, I know we've come to time and I think it's really highlighted, you know, future webinar ideas as well. Um, there's so much to continue with uh, education. I would like to um, just highlight our next webinar. Uh, it's 7th of December. So, um seems crazy the end of the year is on the way marching on the way but uh 7th of december so keep an eye out on your emails um for for the details on topic and speaker um but as always um there is the uh, address to the global tracheostomy uh, website where you'll find information resources um 
about the conference as well and also a link to our YouTube. So this webinar will be posted up on our YouTube site um, in uh, uh, you know a few days time after we've um, just sorted out all the recording. So with that, I would like to sincerely thank the panelists, um, not only for their time today, but also their time for preparation, but all of the time in their clinical training um, and working um, with patients and families to really um, increase our knowledge and understanding. So thank you so much. And thank you to the audience for watching as well and engaging. Um, it really is a community. So um, we're pleased to share this with you. So with that, um, we'll sign off. So um, everyone, wherever you are, have a nice evening or a nice day if you're starting like um, me here in Australia. We'll see you next time. <laughs>